I spoke with Tim from our studios in Washington, D.C. about what sparked his interest in global agriculture. I'm almost the last person in the world you would think would be having this discussion with you. I grew up in New York City. Uh, I, uh, I, if you had told me I was going to focus on global agriculture, I would have said I'm much more likely to end up spending my life studying ants. I mean, it just it was like the last thing in the world I would have thought at the time. But I got into it because I became an environmental lawyer. And as I started working on various challenges related to biodiversity, water quality, uh, I started realizing that agriculture was the challenge. Well, one thing you can do about that is just, so you start saying, well, just I hate agriculture, I don't like agriculture, except that we need to eat. <laughs> and I certainly like to eat, so I can't be too anti-agriculture if I like to eat, that's a bit hypocritical. So what you realize is all about how, how you do agriculture, that how well and how efficiently we do agriculture becomes critical. And I spent uh, most of my career, or I spent about half now, as an environmental lawyer, and then at some point I said, ah, I wanna do something else. So I ended up going to Princeton, basically becoming a scientist. It's a long story how that happened. And it's in that course when I started focusing on global land that it became clear that land is just this limited resource. And I think it's hard, you know, when I grew up, um, Asia seemed really, really remote. Africa seemed really, really remote. I mean, I'm pretty old. I was growing up in the 60s, you know. Partially, we didn't have the internet. Yeah, you could travel there, but it was a really, really big deal. There are all kinds of countries nobody went to. Uh, and the world just seemed a very large place. Well, first of all, now it's easy to get places. Secondly, we now realize we have, there were three billion people when I was born. We have almost eight billion people today. Uh, the world, we realize, is not that big. Now, when you work on global agriculture, it also becomes more concrete to you because you've been to a lot of these places. You know what it looks like. And these aren't remote places on a map. They are places you understand and you, can, you know what it looks like. And now all of a sudden, this idea that we have this infinite amount of land that we can play with completely disappears. And you have to realize, oh my gosh, how are we gonna fit it all in? How are we gonna fit in all the things we need from land uh, in we ain't making more, no more land. So that's something that definitely came over time. In 2019, Tim was lead author of a monumental report which firmly establishes the link between food, agriculture, and the global environment. Talk to us about what your findings were. Talk to us about the whole process, if you will. So the report took us eight years, <laughs> and we had a, a, about a dozen sub-reports before we put it all together for the UN, the World Bank, and the World Resources Institute. And so one of the findings is simply the, the scope of the problem that I've just addressed, that agriculture by itself will be enough to cause dangerous climate change in 2050. If you think of it as 25% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, agriculture occupies half of the world's vegetated land, and we need roughly 50% more food by 2050. Why? The population is growing, but also the vast majority of people in the world eat very poor diets. They eat very little meat, meat and milk. And if, as their incomes hopefully grow, even from being very poor to just being kind of poor, they will be able to eat at least a little bit more meat and milk, and that requires a lot more inputs, a lot more land. So when you put all that together, you're talking about uh, kind of the baseline situation, even if we make historical rates of gain in yields, crop yields, about clearing an area of forest roughly equal to twice the size of India. And that alone would probably prevent us from solving climate change. Now on top of that, the, the production process for agriculture generates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. That mostly comes from microbes. It's not really the energy use. It comes from the fact that there are microbes all over the place that interact in agriculture in ways that generate uh, one of two or both of uh, two very dangerous kinds of emissions. One is methane, uh, which comes from the stomachs of cows, it comes from manure, it comes from rice paddies, and, and the other is nitrous oxide, which mainly comes from all the fertilizer and other nitrogen that we apply to, to crop fields. And so those add up to be a huge source of emissions. So that's the challenge. So then the question is, and the challenge is basically this, we need to produce 50% more food with two-thirds fewer emissions 
and at the very most on the same area of agricultural land. Okay, so how do you do that? Is it possible? Well, the answer is probably yes, if we really work at it. Tim points to China as a country where there's potential for success. With its rich agricultural resources, China has a long history of farming. And since 1978 has created a successful agriculture program. Not only feeding its own population, but also the world's. China is actually a good example. So China is, in one sense, an agricultural miracle. It produces enough food for four times the population of the United States on two-thirds of the cropland. So that's extraordinary, right? And if it didn't produce all that much food, you'd need to clear even more forest. On the other hand, uh, in the course of doing that, there has been less attention paid to how carefully you apply, uh, you apply fertilizer, how carefully you manage animals. And so there's a real opportunity for China to, to reduce emissions. People have shown that you could continue to, you could increase your production while greatly reducing the amount of fertilizer you apply, uh, producing fertilizer in less uh, uh, polluting ways, raising cattle more efficiently. And one of the opportunities, actually, I think, is for China to become a leader in uh, the improved agriculture we want. I mean, when Chinese government decides to do things, things happen. And so several years ago, China decided it was going to become a leader in solar cells. And so most of the world's solar cells are basically produced in China. Well, the same could be true for kind of the innovative technologies that we need the better forms of fertilizer, the different types of management of rice, the different breeds of, of crops that could enable the whole world to produce food with the level of emissions that we can tolerate. Raising animals for food requires large amounts of land and water. It also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions through animal feed, manure, and methane from burping cows. Livestock is responsible for almost 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which contribute to climate change. The outcome of Tim's research showed raising livestock is a huge global problem. What were some of the key takeaways? So apart from the, 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 the size of the problem, I mean, let me give you a few other examples. So I don't think people have sufficiently emphasized the challenge of beef. So uh, beef production is more or less half of the world's land use. Half of the carbon that we've lost from global land due to agriculture is due to beef. Uh, it produces almost half of the production emissions, so the methane and the nitrous oxide. And it provides 2 to 3% of the global calories. That's it. So it is a stunning, stunning luxury uh, to have beef. And uh, as we increase our demand for beef, it's mostly coming from Latin America, where you are clearing tropical rainforest and other valuable habitats with a lot of carbon to produce that additional beef. So one of the discoveries was, yeah, we really, it's beef. It's all about the beef to some extent in terms of holding down consumption. On the other hand, it's also true that there are opportunities to produce beef with three or four times as efficiency, or should rephrase that, to produce beef three or four times uh, as efficiently as we do today. So in a typical hectare of land in Brazil, you can probably produce four times as much beef in a way that reduces these, the methane per, per uh, kilogram of beef. And uh, so there are, that is equally important. Uh, and so we need to do both. And that's one of the kind of key messages that people have a hard time except we need to do all of the above. We need to do produce more food in the same land with fewer inputs and hold down our consumption of those foods that take a huge amount of land, a huge number of emissions. I've talked to some other folks who have, have uh, mentioned exactly what you mentioned, and uh, they're not uh, particularly uh, welcome in Nebraska or Montana <laughs> or where, where uh, yeah. beef is. Uh, is this a tough sell in some parts of uh, not just the United States, but elsewhere? Well, it is. But, you know, actually, it's interesting. I get into debates with people sometimes, and they're saying, look at all this value of our good grazing or whatever. And what should these farmers be doing? And I say, 
they should be producing beef. And the reason is that even if we hold down our growing demand for beef, we're still going to probably need more beef. So if you're a farmer producing beef well, you should still produce beef. It's just that the number of additional people on the planet and the fact that so many of them now eat so little meat and milk, that that creates this gigantic expansion of demand. So our recommendation is that the average American, average European should consume 50% less beef per day or per week. It's basically like one and a half hamburgers a week instead of three, in part to create a little space for most of the people in the world even just eat a little bit of beef. And so, so actually when I make it clear to people that actually there's still a big role for beef farmers to do that well, uh, people go, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it changes the discussion a great deal. Despite their nutritional value, many of our favorite foods are often poor choices when it comes to their impact on the environment. Tim, we're inside a market not far from our offices. We're looking at all these berries. That would seem like a good choice. Talk to us about this. Yeah, so I love berries. I love the fact that we have berries available to us uh, now all around, all, all year. Um, as a whole, the amount of berries you eat isn't critical for your food supply, but they're pretty high emissions. And the reason is, in order to have fresh berries, they have to be flown. And flying is the one energy use for, for food products that really does cause a lot of emissions. If you ship things, it's from my truck, and eh, it's not that big a deal, but flying causes a lot of emissions. So having all these wonderful berries now year round, it's kind of a luxury, a kind of a greenhouse gas luxury. And yet we can walk over here a little bit closer, and this is probably a good choice you're yeah, saying, so right? So hummus is a great example of what we should be eating more of. I mean, hummus comes from chickpeas, it has a lot of protein, uh, it actually has kind of good fat, and so it's, it's really a substitute for meat and milk. And basically to produce chickpeas is a tiny fraction of the amount of land and generates a fraction of the emissions uh, that are used to produce meat and milk, particularly beef. And in fact, chickpeas are an example of a legume which fixes its own nitrogen. So you basically either add no or very little nitrogen fertilizer so you don't even have that kind of pollution problem. Agriculture is fundamental to humans, but the way we use that land has profound consequences on climate change. Talk to us about land use because it, it, it's, it is different. One crop can give you a lot more of something and some are more damaging to the, to the soil and, and some have more of an you know, impact on our environment. Well, it's, so it's true. So we use crops for different purposes. And there's an interesting trade-off sometimes. So for example, if you grow corn intensively, which most of the world calls maize, uh, you can get very high yields, but it needs a lot of fertilizer. Uh, so the advantage is that uh, you will get a lot of food per hectare. And the disadvantage is you'll probably have a lot of nitrogen fertilizer pollution. And one of the questions is, uh, well, how do we balance that with, let's say, growing uh, another crop uh, like um, peas, and peas uh, have more protein, and they fix their own nitrogen, uh, but they have a lot lower yields. So you need to be able to, you know, effectively in the world we need all of the above, but the question is which amount and which do you kind of encourage to try to expand. So one issue is simply getting the right balance. and. And when you have the opportunity to improve one rather than another, which you should focus on. But there's another issue which your question goes to, which is, um, do we recognize one fundamental challenge we have, which is the amount of land in the world is fixed. So if you use one hectare of land for one purpose, you're not using it for another. And this is something the whole world has kind of missed. So for example, some people say, well, look, if I take a hectare of land producing corn and I instead use it to make ethanol and replace uh, fossil fuels with that, that's good. I'm, I'm using fewer fossil fuels. But we need the corn. And so where are you going to produce the corn? Well, if you clear another hectare of forest to produce the corn, 
the net consequences are your actual greenhouse gas emissions go up because forests are carbon. And when you convert forests, that carbon goes into the atmosphere. So if you don't recognize that there's only so much land, you think this is good when in fact it's bad. And then you get other arguments. So, well, look, what if we, instead of doing that, what if we increase the amount of food we produce on other corn land? And then you say, yeah, but we already need to do that. We need to do that by 50% or more. <laughs> so that doesn't, that's still robbing from Peter to pay Paul because we still need to do that. So one of the things we have to recognize is just changing how we use land isn't necessarily a benefit. It's just producing one thing rather than another. And so the, ultimately, we have to use land more efficiently. So that means on corn land, we need higher yields of corn. <laughs> and on tomato land, we need higher yields of tomato. But it also means that for forests, we want to manage them to be really good forests, not bad forests. Uh, we want to let them grow. And so we shouldn't be wasting any land. And the other thing it means is, we want to hold down our demand for land. Because we used to think there's all this free land out there and it's just being wasted. But that free land stores carbon. What people may not know is that for every ton of carbon in the atmosphere, there are at least four tons of carbon in the world's uh, vegetation, mainly forests and soils. And when we clear land and start using it to grow things, we release that carbon. And about a third of the carbon in the atmosphere is due to all of our agricultural use. And to solve climate change, we need more of that carbon. So we need to think of every hectare of land as precious. And so if you're managing, if you're, if you're managing it for agriculture, but you're not doing well for agriculture, then you're wasting it. You should be blamed. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're under a moral obligation to actually manage it better. And similarly, if you're kind of burning down forests and you know, not letting them grow and whatever, that's also a problem. And so, and now as we all have the biodiversity crisis, we've got to make sure that when we devote land to biodiversity, we really make sure that it's protected for biodiversity, which is a problem because we actually have all these protected areas that we don't really protect. So one of the key themes of the report is the way we should really think of every hectare of land now as sacred. We have to use it well, it cannot be wasted. Tim, it was a delight. Thanks so much. Well, thanks for having me.